Hello, everybody. My name is Christian, and I'm live here from San Antonio. Uh, I've been here for about three weeks now. Can't wait to see you guys. Uh, man, I really do miss you guys. Uh, it, it's something that you don't really realize until you're gone, you know, missing the brotherhood. How much would I rather be over there with you guys instead of all the way down here in Texas? Don't get me wrong, Texas is great, but man, I really do miss you guys. Um, so for Tuesday night's Bible study, the topic's going to be revival. You know, what can we do to bring forth God's revival? But I'm going to wait a couple seconds for people to log on. And I want to start off by, um, before we begin with this lesson, um, man, just God is good. God is just good all the time. There's never been a moment in history where God has not been good. Uh, even when we don't see the goodness uh, whether we see it afterwards, we just understand by the word of God and by what he's already done that God is good. So no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're experiencing, the pain, the hurt, the anxiety, the nervousness, uh, God is good. And we know that from Jesus Christ. We know that by his sacrifice on the cross. You know, we should never ever question the goodness of God because he is in control of the past, present, and future. And everything works out for those who love him and for those uh, who follow him. No matter what happens, Jesus is always faithful and he's always good. All right. Let's get it going. That's good stuff. All right. How do we bring forth revival? First things first. Um... We're going to start with scripture because that's obviously what's a Bible study without the Bible. We're going to st uh, start off by reading some scripture. And then I want to hit three key points uh, on how to bring forth revival. Uh, let's start off with John chapter 15, verse 5. We're going to be primarily in the book of Acts, but we're going to start off in John. A little bit of uh, Christ's words here. John 15, verse 5. Now, pay close attention to this, Christian. I'm speaking to Christians here. If you are listening today and you're an unbeliever, hey, it's good to have you. I hope you learned something, but I'm primarily talking to the Christians who have the Holy Spirit of God. Hopefully, by the end of this, you might actually be a Christian. John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus is speaking here. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him will produce much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone doesn't remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. One thing we need to understand, church, we can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ. So we're over here talking about, you know, how do we bring forth revival? Well, first things first, we need to understand that Jesus Christ, he's the one that does everything. Without him, we can do nothing. We can have the best preachers. We can hire the best musicians, the best singers. Jesus just said, hey, without me, you can accomplish absolutely nothing. And so before we even start considering how to bring revival in our lives, in our church, in our communities, in our nation, in our world, we need to first understand that without Jesus Christ, we're not getting off the ground. Uh, we can't move forward without acknowledging this pivotal, important thing. Without Christ, we cannot move forward. All right. One thing we need to understand about revival is this. Revival comes by the hand of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to give you some verses to point in this direction. Revival comes by the hand of God. We cannot wake up one day and say, we're going to bring revival. No, like what Jesus said, hey, without me, you can do not, uh, you can't do anything. Without Christ Jesus, we can't do anything. So it comes by the hand of God. It is accomplished by the hand of God, and it will be done by the hand of God. So let's turn to the book of Acts. All right. So for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Bible, the book of Acts is the time period after Jesus Christ was crucified and came back to life. The book of Acts is what the apostles, what those early Christians did with this information that, oh my goodness, Jesus is the son of God. He died and he came back to life. Acts is a couple days after the crucifixion. And let's start off with verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. 
Now, this is Jesus uh, after he came back to life. While Jesus was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. He's talking to the apostles here, the 12 or the 11. But to wait for the Father's promise, which Jesus said, you have heard, we, uh, you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist uh, baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? Jesus responded, it is not for you to know the times or the periods uh, that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. If anybody here plans to go to MIT uh, at Witten, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a memory verse. So uh, go ahead and start memorizing that. I'll say it again for you future students. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. All right. So our first thing, in order to bring forth revival, what you can do as a Christian is this. Obey. Obedience. You need to obey the Lord. The first step is always obedience. Look what it says here. The apostles came and they're like, okay, Jesus, uh, are you going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to restore Israel? You know, uh, the Romans are still here. You know, uh, you didn't really fix the nation of Israel. Uh, and Jesus responded, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that my father has set before you on, on his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You mustn't go anywhere just yet. Um... Uh, verse 4, while he was still with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. Now, this can be very difficult for, uh, for me, to be told to wait, to be told to stand still. Christian, don't literally do not do anything. Just stay right there. I will take care of it. I'm, I'm just like, I want to do something. God here is going, no, no, no. You need to stand fast and obey. We are on his time, not on our time. You know, again, we don't wake up one day and, and just choose for people to be converted. That is all on Jesus. The first thing we need to do in order to bring revival in our lives and in the lives of those we love is obedience. Galatians chapter 5 verse 25, Paul the apostle commands us, stay in step with the spirit. He's saying you've got to stay in step with with the spirit the spirit is moving the spirit is constantly moving and if we're not moving with them we're going to be unfruitful we're not going to be successful uh, christians um we need to stay in step with the spirit it's possible to be a christian and not be led by the spirit this is a very interesting thing to know some christians possess the holy spirit but they're not led by the Holy Spirit of God. And we know this because there are Christians in our churches that are living in rebellion. There are, there are Christians that don't attend uh, the service Sunday morning. There are Christians that don't read the scriptures. It is possible to have him, but not follow him. The Apostle Paul is begging you, please stay in step with the Spirit. Please stay in step. Because we are on his time, not on our time. So the first thing that is needed for revival is obedience as we read. The second thing we need is devotion. We need to be devoted to Jesus Christ. Let's skip down to uh, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem, again, in obedience to what Jesus had commanded them. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journeys away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They were all continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. There is a lot to note here. And of course, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments. You see people here that weren't Christians in the Gospels. We're looking at Jesus' brothers and sisters. Uh, the ones that doubted him in the Gospels are now with the apostles, um, which is very interesting to know. And that's very key. Uh, the, the, I'm actually going to quote 
from one of his brothers that is up here in the upper room later on in this little sermon. And they were continually united in prayer along with the woman, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now picture this. Picture this. The apostles, these people are confused. They're not understanding what Christ is doing. They're going, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Romans are still over us. They're taxing the bejesus out of us. Are you kidding me? And uh, Jesus goes, it's not for you to know the times. So they're kind of confused. They're scared because not only do we have the Romans on our back, now we have the Pharisees on us. So we're just being oppressed from all angles. And they're nervous. They don't understand what's going on. It can, Christ, Christ can be confusing sometimes. Nevertheless, if we go back to our first point, obedience. We need to be obedient. Even though we can't see the step, when dad tells us to stick a step forward, you will take a step forward. Even though you cannot see the next step, take the next step. Uh, being in the military, I understand how important it is for a soldier to follow orders. When you question an order or when you delay to execute an order, people can get injured and possibly die. The same thing with the word of God and as a Christian. I am commanded, Christian, you are to love your enemy. But why? I don't see the reason behind that. That's not for you to see the reason behind that. I commanded you to love. So love. You know, if I choose to not love my enemy, that person now saw the hypocrisy in me and now he doesn't want to hear the gospel that I'm teaching. You see how, you see how quick uh, a possible conversion was changed because I refused to obey the word of the living God. Even though I can't see the wisdom, I still have to obey. And so I don't want to go back to the first step, but if anything, the first step is super important. Again, obedience. We're talking about devotion here. And they were devoted to prayer. Um, how important is prayer in a Christian's life? Let me tell you, it is very, very important. Prayer is fundamentally important to a believer. Uh, I was uh, There was a quote that said, uh, you know, what's more important, scripture reading or prayer? And, you know, I responded, well, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? Breathing in and breathing out are equally important. The same thing with prayer and uh, scripture meditation. But they were all continually united in prayer. Now, I want to go to James chapter 5. The funny thing is, James is actually in verse 14. Uh, the person we're about to read and study, the, the half-brother of Jesus, that's here, that is experiencing this firsthand, is now going to write about it. This is super cool. It's like you can, you can see the, the character developments of these people. Uh, you, you see their mistakes, and then you see their recovery. You, you see their, uh, their redemption story. James chapter 5, verse 14 through 18. Please read this for yourselves. Let's see. Chapter 5, verse 14. And this actually applies to us as a, as a Witten family. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he shall be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now check this. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced fruit. I believe that uh, that history bit can be found in Kings. I don't know if it's First and Second Kings. I'll, I'll probably write it in the comments. But it's found in the book of Kings. Um, you see this Elijah, a prophet. Uh, James goes, hey, he, he was just like us. But he prayed earnestly. Earnestly. Now, if we go back to the book of Acts. We see that the apostles were praying continuously. Pray continuously pray earnestly we must be devoted do you want to see revival in your life do you want to see revival in the lives of others around us we need to be people of prayer when jesus christ walked into the temple and he saw all the thieves in there he started throwing all the money uh, all the uh, coin changers all the money changers all the money tables away he was like what are you guys doing my house is supposed to be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves 
we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. How much more do we need to be a house of prayer? <laughs> oh my goodness. If, if the temple was continually, continuously offering up prayer, how much more do we as God's saints and as God's tabernacle of the Holy Spirit? We need to be continuously praying. Christian, do you believe that God hears your prayers? Do you believe that your prayers reach Jesus' ears? I do. I 100% believe he hears my prayers. As a matter of fact, he's answered like two of them in the past 24 hours. I'm super psyched about it. You know, there's no better feeling than, oh my gosh, he just answered my prayer. Like, I, I, I prayed and he answered. Like, it actually, it's a cause and effect. Like, it actually works. Um, we need to understand that prayer has great effect, especially for a believer. How many times in the book of Psalms does it say, hey, he hears the prayers of the saints. He hears the prayers of righteous people. He will come save you. He will, he will, he will. Let us never underestimate the power of prayer. And so in order to bring revival in your life, revival in the lives of those around you, there must be prayer. There must be prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. All right, the Apostle Paul wants to share something. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. All right, Apostle, what you got? What you got for us? Um, boom. Devote yourself to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul is commanding you and I, devote yourself to prayer and stay alert in it with thanksgiving. We need to stay awake in our prayer. How many prayers has God answered and we haven't given him thanks? How many prayers has he answered and we just forget that he answers them? We just, oh, cool, something awesome happened. Well, did God receive the praise? Because it says, devote yourself to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. There needs to be thanksgiving along with your prayer. Because the good in our lives will always outweigh the bad, church. I woke up with sight. I woke up with hands and feet. I have plenty to be thankful for. So devote yourself to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Never underestimate your prayer. Now, I will, I will uh, say this. There's a little caveat to this. There's a little, uh, little, little star at the corner of this verse, hypothetically speaking. There are times when God does not listen to your prayer. Now, listen closely. There are times when God doesn't listen to your prayer. James chapter 1 says that if you doubt, God isn't going to listen to you. God isn't going to answer uh, a person who's doubting that their prayer is going to be heard. James chapter 4 says that if we uh, ask with the wrong motive, he's not going to pay attention. In the book of Matthew says that if we pray for everyone else to see how awesome and religious we are, God's definitely not going to answer that. We understand... Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, that if we don't honor people who need to be honored in our lives, our prayers will be hindered. Uh, more more, uh, more focused, 1 Peter chapter 3 states that if you don't honor your wife, your prayers will be hindered. Um, but in reality, if you expand that, anybody that needs honoring, if you are not honoring that person, God's not going to honor your prayer. Isaiah 58 states that if we disregard the poor, if we don't take care of those vulnerable among us, God's not going to pay attention. He even says, I don't even care if you fast or not. If you don't pay attention to the poor, to the widows, I'm not going to care about your prayer. Uh, Amos, man, this man goes, I don't want to listen to your song. You, all, 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 all these songs you keep singing to me, I need you to be quiet. Shh. I'd rather you be quiet. I'd rather not even hear your worship and your praise and your prayer because you're living in such hypocrisy. Change the way you think and act. Humble yourself before God and he will exalt you, the book of James says. There needs to be, again, back to step one, obedience. Without obedience, there will not be revival. There won't be revival. Obedience and devotion. Obedient to the word of God, obedient to the Holy Spirit, and be devoted to with one another. So there's like, there's a sense of, I'm going to be obedient to you, but I'm also going to be devoted to the saints and I'm going to be worshiping with the saints. There is no such thing, church, as a one person church. There isn't. There isn't such a thing as a one person church. Um, you can't do church on your own. You just can't. Church is a body. It is an organization. It is a team sport. 
people who say, well, you know, I don't need the church. You know, I'm just, you know, I got me and my girlfriend, you know, we're, you know, that's as much church as I need. You must not know Jesus. You must, he liked crowds. Jesus Christ liked having people around him. He said, hey, you 12, you're going to be with me wherever I go. <laughs> you know, he liked having people with them. And that is, you know, the church. Um, and don't worry, Chris, no need to, no need to apologize. Glad to have you. Um, we need to understand that we need to be devoted to God and to each other and to prayer and to fasting and all these things. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. All my notes. Actually, you know what? Let's go and read Acts chapter 1. I don't know if I read this already. I'll make sure I did because reading scripture is the most important thing you'll hear me say here. So I want to make sure we get it right. Yeah, 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 of course. They were devoted to the scriptures. Okay. The execution. The day of revival. Let's hit it. All right, so after the apostles were obedient, after they were devoted to prayer and to being unified together, let's see what happens. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Woo! Let's go. When the day of Pentecost had arrived... They were all together in one place. Again, there's that unity part. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Wow, what kind of church service is that? Are they Pentecostal? Is that where they... Oh, look, that's where they get the word Pentecostal from, from the day of Pentecost. Here it is. This is what obedience and what devotion get you right here. A pouring of the Holy Spirit. Let me make a very... Again, let me make another distinction. You can have the Holy Spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to have the Holy Spirit. But you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is a choice that you have to make every single day. The Apostle Paul says, hey, don't get drunk with wine, uh, which leads to wild living, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's a very interesting analogy. He was comparing being filled with the Holy Spirit of God with being filled with alcohol. And I want to expand on this a little bit. You know, when, uh, when I take alcohol and I drink, not only is my belly filled with alcohol, but now my attitude is beginning to change. The way I do things changes. What I say changes. The way I think changes. Uh, my character and my being become different from what I regularly am. Uh, alcohol will change and impair you. Now he says, the Apostle Paul says, no, no, no. Forget that crap. Be filled with the Spirit. Again, using the same analogy, you're filling yourself with him and by filling yourself with the holy spirit your character will begin to change the way you act will begin to change what you say will begin to change the same way alcohol changes the person for the net for the worse the holy spirit will fill you for the better but you need to be filled again we understand the apostles had the holy spirit of god but now they are filled with him Revival comes when we are filled more with the Holy Spirit than we are filled with ourselves. Each morning we wake up, we have a choice to make. Will I serve the Lord Jesus Christ or will I serve myself? Those are the only two. Those are the only two options you have, believer. Will I be filled with him or with myself? Either you make that conscious decision or it is made for you by your actions. But those are the only two avenues that your day can go. Be filled with the Spirit or be filled with myself. So now the apostles are on fire, literally. You know, you see, um, uh, uh, the arrival of Christ was proclaimed by the angels. The arrival of the Holy Spirit was proclaimed by believers filled with the Holy Spirit. And so look, you know, we have Jesus, Jesus' ministry beginning in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we have the Holy Spirit's ministry. You know, Christ is in heaven. Christ is on the throne ruling waiting for the time to come back. Now it's the Holy Spirit show. Uh, Jesus had a go at it for three years. Now the Holy Spirit is going to have at it. This is the time of the Holy Spirit. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so who's in charge of our church right now? His name is the Holy Spirit. That is who is in charge of our church as we speak. That is the head. And they were filled 
Oh, again, wow. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now you fast forward down to chapter uh, uh, to verse 17 of the same chapter. You know, the people around them are going, oh, boy, these guys are crazy. Uh, um, you know what? I, I guess I can read it. Why not? This is the scriptures. I'm going to read it. Continuing on verse 5. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, before we, go, before we continue, this is the day of Pentecost. This is a uh, Jewish holiday. So all the Jews are coming from all over the world to celebrate the Passover. I'm sorry, the, to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem. Uh, I believe the, the, the festival of Pentecost was the festival of first fruits. I have to look into that a little bit more. And there, uh, there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't these people Galileans? How is it that each of them, uh, that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, Falphilia, Egypt, and, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. We heard them declaring the magnificent. Uh, we heard them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own language, and they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, "What does this mean?" But some sneered and said, "They're drunk on wine." Ha! There goes the drunk part. <laughs> there goes the analogy of, uh, of you know, of drunkenness. And so we have all these people who are now hearing the apostles speak the gospel of Jesus in their perfect dialect. I'm talking about they pulled out some Egyptian, like, right there, perfect. Like, okay, say I learned how to speak uh, Japanese. You know, I would have an accent for a long time. I, some, uh, I probably would never be able to kill my accent. These people spoke that language perfectly because the Holy Spirit gave them power to do that. Um, so what does this mean? Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay close attention to my words. For these people aren't drunk as you suppose, since it is only nine in the morning. Hello? On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the days of, uh, in the later days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. Wait, does that mean women can be prophets? Interesting. I will display wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here it is. We finally have it. The day of the Lord. It is coming. Um, first thing we need to have is obedience. The second thing we need to have is devotion. And the third thing we need to have is faith. Faith that it will come. Faith that it will come. And so after... Uh, the apostle Peter, you know, shoots this fiery sermon. Skip down to verse 17. Let's see the reaction. Uh, 17, 21. Yeah. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 47. When the people heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Man, you ever been pierced to the heart? You ever seen something that just like, it, it bypasses all of your defenses and you start crying? You know, you don't, you don't even have time to not, you know, to focus on not crying. It just hits you so hard out of nowhere that you are just pierced to the heart. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall I do? What should we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you. For your children and for all who are far away. That's me. That's us. That, that, that's literally us. He's speaking about us. The promise is for you, 
for your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call. <sighs> With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted the message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves, there's, there's that word again, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. It's right there. Everyone who was, everyone was filled with awe. You ever seen a little kid you know, go to a music park and he's just like, just in awe. You know, when I go to an amusement park, you know, it takes a lot to impress me now. You know, because I understand the the, uh, the mechanisms of it all. I understand that, you know, that I'm not going to die. It's not a roller coaster. But as a kid, you're just thinking, wow. Verse 43, they were filled with awe, childlike wonder, going, what is going on? And many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common there goes the devotion piece they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds the, pro, uh, the proceeds to all as any had need every day they devoted themselves to meeting one another in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts praising god and enjoying the favor of all the people every day the lord added to their number those who are being saved. The third thing we need to have is faith that it is going to come. The fa faith that the rain will come. Like James chapter uh, 5 said, you know, Elijah was just a man like us, but he prayed, Lord, let it not rain until these people change the way they think and act. And then a couple months later, okay, Lord, please bring the rain. And the rain came. Uh, again, reference uh, the book of Kings for that. Uh, either first or second. I have to, uh, I'll have to put it down in the comments. Um, have faith that it will come. Have faith that your obedience will show fruit. I will say this. If you ever wondered why revival hasn't come, perhaps it's because we might not be ready. Are you ready for 3,000 people to show up at our front door? I'm talking to Whitten Memorial Baptist Church as a group, as, as, our, as my, my brothers and sisters. Are we ready to receive 3,000 people? Are we re ready emotionally, spiritually? Do we have our crap together to the point where we can help other people with their crap? <laughs> do we have it all together ourselves? And I'm not saying that we have to be 100% perfect, but are we mentally ready to serve? You know, I was trained as a combat medic a couple of years back. And I was trained to take care of multiple people. You know, I am one medic, but I need to be ready to, to take care of six people if I need to. We call those mass cow operations or mass casualties. You know, um, if we have a mass cow, am I ready to take care? Am I capable? Am I professional and ready enough, competent enough to take care of six people and make sure all six people go home to see their loved ones? Am I competent? In the same way, I will turn around and ask you, Christian, you, Bride of Christ, are you competent enough to help people out? Now, I did the math for you guys. There were about 120 people up in that uh, upper room that was filled with the Holy Spirit. 3,000 were added. If you do the math, that is one Christian for every 25 new believer. One Christian for every 25 new believer. Again, there were 100 pe 120 people, including the apostles, including uh, Jude and James, the brother of Jesus, and Mary, up in that upper room, and 3,000 were added to them, boom, that same day. Are you, could you, do you ever visualize yourself ministering to 25 people? Maybe, maybe revival hasn't come yet because you have not given that amount, that a good amount of thought. We need to be ready at a moment's notice this Sunday. We need to be ready this Sunday to have a hundred people come before the altar and repent and come to Christ. We need to be ready to minister to people. How can you go to church and not be ready? How can you go to Bible study and not have your Bible? We, we're, we're still not prepared for this. So one thing we need to consider, are we prepared. Um, again, we need to have obedience. We need to be devoted to the Lord 
in each other and we need to have faith. I want to share a story um, about a farmer. Now check this out. This farmer, uh, let me begin the story with this. There were a couple kids in the, in the country um, and they were riding their bikes and they uh, get to a farmer and the farmer's just putting razor wire over a patch of dirt. And they were like, that's kind of weird. Why is he protecting dirt? Why is he taking all this time to take care of, uh, to take care of dirt? What is he doing? Um, and the kids left. And then they came back the next day and the old man was still working on a patch of dirt. Why? And the kids are wondering, why on earth are the, uh, is this old man taking so many precautions and is doing so much work on this patch of dirt. The kids thought it was just weird. Now, um, uh, a couple weeks later, they decided to check up and see if that weird old man is doing his thing again. And they pull up and they see uh, crops, lots and lots and lots of crops coming forth from the ground from that weird, from that uh, patch of dirt. And they realized, oh, he was actually trying to grow something. The world will think that we are weird because we are preparing for something that isn't here yet. <sighs> the world will think that we are crazy because we are preparing for believers this upcoming Sunday. We should be prayerfully expecting, we should be expecting people to be coming to Jesus this upcoming Sunday. I expect it. It is no longer, you know, oh, I hope. No, I expect it. Where, where's yet? Where, where are you at? You know, I know the Lord's been knocking on your heart. Are you ready to surrender yet? All the preparation, all the obedience, all the devotion is the same thing with the old man taking care of that patch of dirt. The world will come and they'll call us crazy because we're taking so long and, and, and being so prayerful for something that we can't see. But one day the, the world will see the fruit and they'll go, oh, wow. Wow, that's, that's very crazy. That is very crazy. Um, I can go back to, uh, to the whole, um, my disciple, Carlos, you know, even before he was a believer, I still ministered to him and I still prayed over him. I still sang over him. I still tried my hardest to do everything I could in my power to lead him to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the world could see that as he, he's wasting his time. He is totally wasting his time. I was taking care of a patch of dirt. I was putting razor wire. And that razor wire being my prayer, that razor wire being my protection over him, making sure that the enemy would not get to him because he's mine. He might not be a Christian yet, but I'm going to focus so hard in my prayer to make sure that God protects him. And then we see fruit and then we harvest the fruit. And now my disciple is making disciples and, and then fruit will continue on making fruit and fruit again. And Jesus mentioned this multiple times. He, uh, I, I'm going on a rabbit trail here, but this is a good rabbit trail on prayer um, in order to bring, you know, revival. Jesus said, hey, let me tell you a story. And it's the story of a judge, of a very mean judge who didn't uh, care for people. And, um, and this old lady goes up and says, hey, I want justice. Hey, I want justice. You know, this person wronged me. I want justice. And the uh, judge said, I'll get away from me. I don't want to pay attention to you. But the old lady kept coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back to the point where he goes, okay, 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 enough. You know, you know, I'll give you what you want. Just leave me alone. And Jesus said, with that same earnestness, you need to be asking the father. You need to be asking the father. Are you a person that prays once, doesn't get what he wants and then stops praying? Are you that type of believer? Are you that type of prayer warrior that only asks once? Ask again, ask again, ask again. Um, in the book of John, when uh, the Samaritan woman came and said, please, Lord, heal my daughter. Please, please heal my daughter. And Jesus turns around and goes, uh, you're a dog. I'm not going to I'm not going to take care of you. No, I, I'm only here for the people of Israel. Please, please, please. Uh, is it is it right for me to take the, ch the, the bread that goes to the children of Israel and give it to, to the dogs? And the woman goes, yes, Lord, I understand what I am. But even the dog eats the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus goes, bingo. I love that. I love your faith. Go home. Your daughter is healed. Jesus had every intention of healing her daughter. 
He had every intention of doing that. But he wants to take something from you. He wants to draw an answer. Could it be that God ha does, hasn't answered your prayer? Not only because you're not prepared for the answer, but because he wants to know how much you want it. He wants to see it. Do, do you want your family members to be saved? Does your prayer reflect that? Do you want a wife or a husband? Does your prayer reflect that? You know, if you ask once, you probably don't want it a whole lot. So how earnest are you battling in your prayer? We look at the book of Acts. They were devoted to prayer. Jesus said, hey, my house will be a house of prayer. We are to be a house of prayer because God answers prayer. Because God is glorified in answering our prayers. But it all goes back to Galatians where we have to be in step with the Spirit. God is not going to honor prayers that aren't according, uh, that aren't uh, in line with His will. Um, so in order to have answered prayers, we need to first understand what the Spirit is doing. Jesus in the Gospels said, um, uh, Wherever I see my Father go, I go. Whatever I hear my Father say, I say. If I see my Father pick up and go, I pick up and go. If I see Him uh, say something, I'm going to say something. He was teaching us how we need to be. And we need to be so filled with the Spirit, so filled with His presence, that we know exactly where to go. Christians without direction are very useless people. And we have seasons of that. And I mean, that's not a shot against anybody. But if you're not being led by the Spirit, then what are you being led as? Uh, led by? You know, it's kind of scary. What are you, uh, by yourself? Are you being led by your own soul? By demons? What are you being led by? If it's not by the Spirit? By your flesh? By sin? So again, to wrap everything up into a nice little present uh, for the church. In order to bring revival to your life. In order to reignite that passion you once had. Or for conversion, really. Obedience. Be obedient to the Word of God. Even though you might not understand... Even though you might not know what the next step is, understand that obeying orders saves lives. Back to the combat medic phase of, of me. If you do not follow orders, people will get hurt. If you don't love your enemy, people will continue to be hurt. If you don't pray for your enemy, people will continue to be hurt. Wait, are you saying I have to pray for Biden? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. We are commanded to pray uh, um, from a sincere heart, like the book of Acts said. Um, please be obedient to the word of God, even the parts where that make us uncomfortable. Be obedient. Step two, be devoted. We understand from the book of Acts that the apostles were devoted to each other, to prayer, to fasting, to the breaking of bread. They were devoted. That is what their whole life's purpose was now. They threw away their past life and said, okay, I am surrendering every part of me. Now we are going to start devoting ourselves to the things of the Lord. I know you're scared. I know you're confused. I know you could be nervous. But be devoted to Yahweh. And He will set your path straight. And after obedience and devotion, wrap it all up in faith. Faith. Understand that the rain is coming. It will come. God is a God of promises. And... I've been alive for 24 years and never once has he broken his promise. God has faithfully, faithfully served me for 24 years and never once has he abandoned me. Never once has he treated, has he treated me with contempt. Never once has he disregarded me. In 24 years, he has been faithful to me. And even in times when I wasn't a Christian, I still look back and I still see God's providential, graceful hand making sure things align perfectly for me. Even when I hated him, he loved me back. Understand and have faith that God's revival will come. And again, prepare for a mass cow. Prepare for this huge influx of people coming to ask you, hey, okay, so how do I get saved? Could you imagine sitting in service and, you know, a stranger that walked right up the street goes, hey, uh, um, how, do, how do I get saved? And you're going, uh... Uh, 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 we'll wait for the pastor. No, dummy, he came to you. You gave him the answer. You know, that's the same attitude the uh, disciples had. Uh, Jesus, uh, this huge group of 3,000 people don't have any food. 
you know, should we send them away? Jesus goes, no, you provide for them. They don't need to go away. Oh, but Jesus, we only have a couple fish and bread. Okay, well, give them to me. I'm, I'm going to multiply. I'm going to multiply it and then give it back to you for you to serve those 3,000 people. Wait a minute. We're dealing with 3,000 people here. Huh. It's weird how the Bible just all like, it's a huge big old circle. Jesus gave them the bread to minister. And so don't think that it is the pastor's job or the Bible teacher's job to explain the Bible. Saint, it is your job. It is your job to take what we give you and your own private study and share it with your family. You know, I might not be a parent, but I work with the youth. And let me tell you right now, it is not me or Brother Jeremiah's resp sole responsibility to teach your kids the word of God. You can't expect them to listen to us for an hour Sunday morning and then be peachy keen for the rest of their lives. That's not how that works. They need to hear this day in and day out from you guys. We might, all we do is fine tweaking. All we do is, you know, one lesson here and there, make sure they got it. But at the end of the day, their bulk should come from you guys. We can't expect revival to show up if revival isn't active in our hearts. Before God brought the 3,000, he first brought the 120. Before he changed Shelby County, before he changed Memphis, he changed Witten Baptist Church. Before he changed the world, he changed the 12 disciples. He always starts with us, and then he gives us the resources to bless the earth. He gave the, the disciples the bread and the fish to feed the 3,000. And then he gave the apostles the Holy Spirit to feed the 3,000 people who, who, who were shot to the heart. And they went, what do I do? What do I do? Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And this gift is a gift for you and for your children and for people who are far off like me. And so I hope that this answered any questions. Um, I'll be on for a couple more minutes to see if anyone has any comments or any questions. Um, no, but Acts is so full of the Holy Spirit's power. Um, the original, uh, the original book, you know, when we, when the uh, ancient people put it together, was Acts of the Apostles. In reality, it's really the book should be titled Acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, Jesus had a ministry in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Holy Spirit's ministry was the book of Acts, and then so on and so forth. Um, and we are living in this to this day. We are children of people who are influenced by this event. Church, the event that happened in Acts chapter 2 is connected to your conversion. Someone that was converted by the Holy Spirit um, was converted by someone with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we go all the way up into this event this is when it came and when it started spreading we are a product of pentecost we are a product of what happened here and so if you guys have any questions obviously i'm going to be here for another minute um but i hope i wrapped everything up decent uh faith is super important devotion is super important obedience is super important and obviously, John chapter 15, verse 5, that without Jesus, we can do nothing. Without Jesus, we're useless. We, we can do nothing. A toy can do nothing without its batteries. The same thing without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We're ineffective. We are ineffective. We're living in darkness. We are living in darkness uh, if we do not have the Holy Spirit leading us. Um, but again... Like Galatians, like the Apostle Paul teaches, we need to be in step with the Spirit. Uh, so what I heard you say was you're teaching Ethan and Sierra everything you know. Okay, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I saw, I saw that he got the letter a couple days, uh, yesterday, I think. And so I was really, 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 really happy he got the letter. Um, I, love all, I love your kids. I absolutely, absolutely love them. Love the stuffing out of them. I uh, can't wait for them to be uh, future pastors and deacons and teachers, which they will be. They will be leaders in this church. They definitely will be. Um, I don't. I don't train. I don't disciple non-leaders. Every person I disciple will be a leader, because every Christian is going to be a leader. Every Christian is a leader. 
You are to lead people. You are to definitely lead people. And although obviously we can't, we, we can't, you know, save someone into heaven, you know, um, we understand that, um, that we can save people from the fire. I believe the book of James or Jude says, hey, snatch them from the fire. And the apostle Paul goes, I have become all things to all people so that I might, might win some. And so there is a, um, a correlation between trying our hardest to conversion. Paul said, hey, to the Jew, I'm a Jew. To the Gentile, I'm a Gentile. I'm going to be all things to all people. I am a free man, but I have become a slave to win some. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, tell that kid to call me. Yeah, I definitely have a phone. I want to see what he thought about the letter. Um, anyway, church, I'll be doing another video in two weeks. Please let me know if you guys need anything. Um, even though I am 12 hours away, my spirit is with you guys. Um, even though, again, I'm 12 hours away, we can still be in step together. And I'm still praying for you guys while I'm over here. Um, and God's working on me over here. You know, we're all being worked on by the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something before I get off. Before I get off, let me just say this. The influx of believers is going to come. Book it. I put bet on it that the influx of believers, of new believers, will come. And you will be surprised where they come from. Uh, in Genesis, when the flood came, water came down from the earth as well as from the heavens. In the same way, the influx of new believers will come from outside the church and from within the church. I expect believers to come in from the streets and come in from the, pole, uh, from the, uh, from the pews that, uh, that are inside our church. Conversions everywhere. I love you guys. I hope this was beneficial as it was for me. Continue studying, continue steadfast in prayer. Be steadfast, be devoted in prayer. And uh, we'll be happily expecting the, uh, the revival. I love you guys.